hybrid studios have become more and more popular in the last couple of years. And I think this is a great thing. The moment you step out of your DAW, you're entering a world of fun and creativity that is quite different from working in the digital world. However, what I often see is that people, once they go out of their computer for the first time, they struggle a little bit because sometimes levels are a little bit too high or too low, their EQ starts to overdrive or the compressor is not working properly. And the common denominator of all these issues is that they don't have matched their analog and digital levels properly because they might look identical, but they are not the same. And in this video, I would like to show you how you can master analog and digital levels and how to think about audio in the future. But rather than giving you a deep dive into all the technicalities, I would like to give you an intuitive way of thinking about matching analog and digital levels. If you want to, however, have a more in-depth overview of this topic, there's a great article on the Elysia website. So let's jump straight into this topic. As I mentioned earlier, analog and digital levels are not the same because they are not measured the same way. Analog levels are usually expressed in dBU values, which is an RMS level that measures positive and negative voltages continuously. That's why you see values above zero dBU because zero dBU is just 0 0.775 volts. But in fact, we have values way higher than zero dBU. For example, the studio level is four dBU. And in Germany, where I come from, it's in fact six dBU. Zero dBU in analog terms is not the maximum level. It's not the maximum that you can reach. In the digital world, however, we have zero dBFS and dBFS stands for decibels relative to full scale. So that is the maximum that you can reach in a digital system. Okay, we now know that analog and digital levels are not the same. Zero dBFS is not equal to zero dBU. What is the missing puzzle? The missing puzzle is in fact your sound card. Understanding your sound card is now key. Because your sound card is the translator or the diplomat between the both worlds. Because it will translate the digital information from your DAW into an analog signal and the analog signal from your hardware back into the computer. So it takes the analog information and converts that into a digital code that your DAW understands. So, in fact, the sound card is now the translator of these two worlds. And how... Does the sound card do that? Well, there is something called a reference level. And the reference level is telling your sound card what is the maximum output that I can send or the maximum input that I can receive. And that is equal to zero dBFS. Let me show you what I mean with my sound card, which is in fact the ADI24 Pro SE. So here in front of me, I have the ADI2 remote, which is this control software of my ADI2 Pro 4SE. And I'm just using it because I can show you here better what I mean. My ADI2 Pro has a set of different reference levels. So I'm in a very luxurious position. And if I click on here, then you see that I have a list of different reference levels available. I always choose 24 dBU. And that means that if I'm reaching zero dBFS, in my plugin or in my DAW, I'm sending out 24 dBU, which is in fact 20 dB higher than studio level. That's why I'm not doing it. Actually, this, the conversion quality of the ADI2 is so good that I can actually just trim the values in my DAW. So I only create a safe headroom in my DAW and I don't need to switch around reference levels. That's what a reference level is giving you. So you need to find out what the reference level of your sound card is. And for that, you actually have to read the manual. <laughs> I know, crazy and absolutely cruel from me, but you only need to do that once, unless you buy a new sound card. But 
the moment you know what your sound card is capable of, you can always set everything accordingly in your chain. One of the prime examples where level matching is absolutely crucial is when it comes to analog filters. I have the X filter here in front of me, and if you think about it, an EQ is a complex array of filters that allows you to cut or boost certain frequencies across the frequency spectrum. And this is not as trivial as it might sound, because the musician that you're recording or the instrument that you are recording will change its velocity and its loudness and intensity across the track. So for example, think about a bass player. He maybe plays the notes a bit, little bit more aggressive in the bridge than in the chorus or the other way around. Or he changes a little bit his playing style depending on the groove. And you have to factor in all of that because you need headroom. The X-Filter, for example, has a phenomenal headroom of 21 dBU. Absolutely phenomenal. But it can also boost and cut 13 dB per frequency. That is phenomenal. But it also means that you need a safe headroom in order to work with it. Because, okay, if I have my bass player and I increase the treble by 13 dB, well, maybe then there won't be that much change. But if I do the same for the low end, then maybe I have a poking note that comes through and that will in fact distort the output of my X filter. And that is not because the X filter is bad in design, it is because it's physics. And we need to think about this. So especially when it comes to an equalizer, I would always go for the safe route and give me as much headroom as possible in order to work with each band, if I know I want to work that way. If I, for example, only cut, then I can in fact go in higher because by cutting the frequency, I will in, in fact lose volume. So all of these things need to be considered. Let me show you now how I would approach my matching process with my outboard chain. All right, so I'm gonna do this in Logic because it's really nice to highlight all those matching features here, but you can do that with any DAW. Logic has a really nice effect called the IO utility tool, and that essentially allows you to create analog chains within your Logic session. So I have the X filter here connected, and I know that the Reference level of my sound card is 24 dBU and the maximum input level of my X filter is 21 dBU. So it's safe to say that we need at least minus 3 dB, right? <laughs> no, I would say go for a lot more because we want to have the safest headroom in order for any like high volume intensive boosting. So I always would go for at least minus 10 dB. Once I would reach the zero dBFS and I would go into the IO to utility and I trim that by 10 dB, I would in fact send out 14 dBU. So I still have 7 dB of headroom in the X filter. I know it's a lot of math, but it's actually kind of um, kind of easy to understand once you've done it. There's another utility that I always use for that, and that is the so-called test oscillator in Logic. It gives you a continuous sign at a certain frequency that I send out at zero dBFS in order to see when I actually start to clip in my chain. Really, really cool. I don't want to show you the audio now because it's very unpleasant, but test that out. A sign is actually a great signal for testing because it stays continuously at the same pitch and at the same level. And then you can sweep through your hardware and find out what the best uh, level is. And I always say that to you guys. Listen to what is happening instead of just looking at values. If something is clipping, it's clipping. It doesn't matter what uh, your manual is saying find out what the issue is and then work from there. Now that we've got the basics out of the way, I want to show you how I approach 
my analog chain calibration. I have the test tone oscillator, as I mentioned before, and I have the IO tool. Next to that, I have DigiCheck NG. DigiCheck NG is the measurement software of RME, and you can use that with every RME interface. In this case, I'm using it with the ADI24 Pro SE. And the great benefit of DigiCheck is that I'm actually working on the hardware level. So I'm getting this straight and direct signal from the converter. And that is absolutely splendid for what I want to do. So I'm having the oscilloscope right over here. And next to that, I have the test oscillator. And once I activate the test tone generator you can see now that i get this beautiful sine wave on the oscilloscope and at the same time we have this beautiful beautiful tone that is now chirping um, so the test zone oscillator creates a sine wave at 1k with an output volume of 0 dbfs which as i mentioned earlier creates at the output stage of my converter a signal that is 24 dBU because I set my reference level to 24 dBU. But because I've inserted the X filter through the IO tool, we can play around with the strength of the signal by using the output volume over here. I've decreased the output volume by 10 dB. So now if we do our math correctly, that means I'm starting at 24, deducting 10 dB, and that will give me now 14 dBU at the output of my converter. And the 14 dBU are now going into the X filter, and we established earlier that the X filter has a headroom of 21 dBU, so I still have plenty of headroom. But watch what happens once I start to increase the signal. So... Everything's good. We just get a bigger sine wave. So now what you can see is we are at minus 3 dBFS, which creates a signal strength of 21 dBU at my converter, at my output. So this is the absolutely last setting that I can do without clipping the signal, because if I go now 1 dBU higher you see that we get these rectangular edges. And this is what we call clipping, folks. This is clipping. And this is absolutely unwanted. This is what we don't want to have. We don't want to have these rectangular shapes over here because this will mean that we create a distortion that is unwanted. On top of that, we get harmonic distortion. That doesn't sound good. And if I go even higher... So now we are at 0 dBFS, meaning we are at 24 dBU. We clip the signal even stronger. So absolutely perfect distortion or perfect clipping here. We don't want to do that. Hence, we set the signal back to minus 10 dBFS. The great thing about this I.O. tool is that I actually can save this as a preset. So as you can see, I have this set as a preset for my X filter. And now whenever I'm having a mixing session, I can just throw this IO tool with those settings onto my track and I'm perfectly fine with the settings. And this calibration can be done for every hardware. Sometimes you have a very precise tool like the Elusia X filter or any other Elusia gear that is measured very precisely. But sometimes I have old tape machines or very old equalizers and there are deviations and the old gear is not having the perfect calibration done. So sometimes really useful to find out what the actual headroom of my hardware is. The last thing I want to show you is what will happen once we start to EQ with the X filter. So let's say we take the X filter, we set one band to one kilohertz, and we actually start to increase and decrease the signal.
as expected, we increased and decreased the signal. But what will happen if I go to another frequency, let's say 100 hertz? You can see that we don't get these strong signal changes because the energy lies around one kilohertz. Remember, just because you've selected a frequency doesn't mean that there is all the energy. So you maybe put in 10 dB, but actually because there's not much energy in that frequency area, it's actually just increasing the signal by 2 or 3 dB and you don't play around with your headroom too much. On the other side, if there is a lot of energy in the frequency range that you've selected, you maybe start to clip earlier. All right, I hope this video was helpful. If you have any questions about matching analog and digital levels, or you would like to know more about Elysia products, please write them down in the comment section below, and I see you in the next video.